Welcome, brothers and sisters. I'll be reading um, from 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. But before we start that passage, I'd just like to remind everyone who wrote this letter to the Corinthians and, um, and who it was addressed to. So for that, I'll briefly read from 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 1 through 3. Paul, called by the will of God to be an apostle of Christ Jesus, to our brother Sosthenes, to the church of God that is in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints together with all those who in every place call upon the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, both their Lord and ours. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So with that in mind, let's see what Paul had to say. Um, starting verse 1. Are we beginning to commend or praise ourselves again? Or do we need, as some do, letters of recommendation to you or from you? You yourselves are our letters of recommendation, written on our hearts, to be known and read by all. And you show that you are a letter from Christ delivered by us, written not in ink, but with the Spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stones, but on tablets of human hearts. Such is the confidence that we have through Jesus, uh, through, uh, through Christ toward God, not that we are sufficient in ourselves to claim anything as coming from us, but our sufficient, uh, sufficiency is from God, who has made us sufficient to be ministers of a new covenant, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. Amen. There is coming a day when no heartache shall come, no more clouds in the sky, no more tears to dim the eye, all is peace forever. 
thou found her. Sorry. Hope you guys are ready, because I am. So I've been ready, actually, this whole five minutes. <laughs> uh, so this old couple decides to take a trip to Israel. And while they're there, unfortunately, the wife passes away in the Holy Land. So the man calls for the undertaker to get him ready to, uh, for her burial back in the States. And when the undertaker comes, he says, well, sir... If you decide to ship her back to the United States, it's going to cost you $5,000. But if you want, you can save some money and bury her hair for only $150. And so the man sits there and he thinks about it, and you could see the little cog spinning in his mind as he's evaluating the different pluses and minuses. And at one moment, he just, you could see he made up his mind and he turns to the undertaker and says, I will ship her back to the United States. I'll pay the $5,000. Slightly confused, the undertaker says, why? I mean, it's a lot of money to spend. And he says, well, you know, I think, he says, I remember reading a story of a, some man dying and being buried here, and then three days later, he rose again. I just can't take that chance. <laughs> and as we all know, tonight's topic, or today's topic, is the resurrection. And it's actually a really deep topic, and what we're going to be doing is we're going to be looking at 1 Corinthians 15, because that's where a, probably a lot is written about the resurrection by Apostle Paul. And just to give, you, give all of us some context of where the resurrection fits into the history of the world, in God's stories, God created a perfect world. Uh, people had peace with God. Everyone was immortal, right? We sinned against God. Sin entered into the world. Death came into the world. And ever since, we've been dying. There's been a 100% mortality rate with all of us, right? And... God sent his son as a sacrifice so that we wouldn't have to bear God's wrath. He sent his son as a sacrifice who lived the perfect life, died on the cross, rose three days later, ascended into heaven. So that was the first resurrection. And now we are waiting for the second coming of Christ. And we know that when Christ comes the second time, all human beings will be resurrected from the very 
first human being, Adam, to every single other person that has ever lived, every single one of our ancestors, your grandparents, great-great-great-grandparents, all the great kings, all the poor peasants, everybody will rise on one day. And for the purpose of this sermon, I'm going to refer to that as the grand resurrection. So there's Christ's resurrection and the last final grand resurrection of all humanity. So as we look through 1 Corinthians 15, keep in mind that there are two resurrections that Paul is referring to. Now, 1 Corinthians 15, the moment, like, you know, when you read it the first time, you realize one thing very quickly. It's the longest chapter in all of uh, Paul's epistles. So it's the longest segment in all of his writings, and he dedicates that to the resurrection. And as I was studying this passage, I'm thinking, Paul, why do you make such a big deal out of the resurrection? Okay, I get it, you talk about it a little bit, but why are you making such a big deal? And in fact, he's defending it, and he's ferocious when he comes to talking about the resurrection. And I'm thinking, why is he so defensive? It's like, almost like, you know when you have a, a sore kind of on your hand, and you, you come to church, and everyone's trying to shake your hand, and you're like, stop, my hand hurts, and you lash out at people. It's, that's what Paul is doing. It's almost as if somebody touched his pain point and he just lashes out and writes the longest segment in all of his letters about the resurrection. Why is it such a big deal to Paul? Paul, don't you have better things to write? Give us some practical tips on how to live the Christian life instead of talking about this resurrection. We get it. We, you made your point. Why are you stuck on it? And that's what I want to do today is I want to look at it and realize why was Paul stuck in it? Why, did it? why was it so important to Paul? And hopefully we can walk away with the same understanding or a bit of that understanding by the end of this message. So let's open up our Bibles to 1 Corinthians 15. Open up your Bibles, whether it's on your phone or in your, in your book. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 12 through 32. We're going to start with that. 1 Corinthians 15, 12 through 32. Paul says, now if, now if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. And we are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified about God that he raised Christ whom he did not raise if it is true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. The first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive, but each in his own order. Christ, the first fruits. Then at his coming, those who belong to Christ. Then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father after destroying every rule and every authority and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. For God has put all things in subjection under his feet. But when it says all things are put in subjection, in subjection, it is plain that he is accepted who put all things in subjection under him. When all things are subjected to him, that's Jesus, then the Son himself will also be subjected to him, that's the Father, who put all things in subjection under him, that God may be all in all. Otherwise, what do people mean by being baptized on behalf of the dead? If the dead are not raised, why are people baptized on their behalf? What? Why are we in danger every hour? I protest, brothers, by my pride in you, which I have in Christ Jesus, our Lord. I die every day. What do I gain if, humanly speaking, I fought with beasts at Ephesus? If the dead are not raised, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. So the first, what we're going to be talking about today is five reasons why the resurrection was a big deal. 
and why it still is a big deal today. So first and foremost, point number one, the resurrection is a big deal because Christianity stands or falls with the resurrection. Paul says, verse 14, he says, and if Christ is not raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. You're, you're believing something completely pointless. It is meaningless. In verse 17, he also repeats, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. If Christ was not raised from the dead, then Christianity is not true. Plain and simple. That's it. That's the end of the story. We could just might as well get up right now and just go on our ways and go have our family dinners, do whatever we want, because if Christ was not, has not been raised, our faith is futile. Because if Christ was not raised, then Jesus was either a liar or a lunatic, or his apostles were liars who just made some stuff up. He said a bunch of claims, got killed, and that's it, and he's not worth following. You see, the resurrection is at the heart of, the, of Christianity. You can't remove somebody's heart without them immediately dying. Think about this. You can remove someone's finger, their arm, their hand, right? Their hand, their arm. You can remove their legs, their ears, their eyes. You can remove all of those things, and yet they can still remain alive. It's not going to look pretty, but they will be alive. But the moment you remove someone's heart is the moment they die. And so, just to carry this analogy back to Christianity, I think you can go so far as to say that you can remove Christ's miracles out of the Bible, out of Christianity. You can remove the prophecies of Christ and still have Christianity, but you cannot remove the resurrection and still have Christianity. Because if he was not raised, all of his words are immediately disqualified. And the peace that he supposedly creates between us and God is non-existent, and we are still in our sins, and we still don't have hope to have peace with God. If he was not raised, he was simply a good teacher and a good man that gave us an example of love and sacrifice, what so many people say, but beyond that, he is nothing else. But if the resurrection is true, if Christ did die and was raised from the dead three days later, then Christianity is true. Then all the claims that Jesus and the Bible make are also true. You cannot accept the resurrection and deny the rest of Christianity. It's an all-inclusive package. And I love the side effect of the resurrection. Think about this. There are difficulties in the Bible. There are things that are hard to understand, and there are things that are hard to explain. Not just to unbelievers, but also to believers, right? And there's people that say, well, if God is all good, how can there be evil? If the, you know, or the Bible contradicts itself all the time, it, it's not worth believing. And I will agree that there are hard things about Christianity to explain and to understand. But the fact that the resurrection exists and that it's true sets all those other things kind of to a second level of importance. And I'll explain why. Because if you have the resurrection then you know that no matter how hard other things to believe are, that they must be true because the resurrection validates the Christian message. And let me give you an example. Imagine you try to explain calculus to a third grader. And you sit there patiently and you're trying to explain to them and trying to explain and they're like, well, that doesn't make sense. What are negative numbers, right? Because <laughs> they don't teach you that until like fourth grade. And they can't wrap their undeveloped minds around the thought of calculus. And, and, and they might go so far as to say, you know what, this isn't true. It doesn't make sense. It's contradicting itself. Well, all, all you have to do is make the point that, you know what, we used calculus to go to the moon. We proved it. We used this to go to the moon. Here are the results. Here's the proof. And then, no matter how hard calculus is to understand, you know that it's true because you see the results of it. And it's the same thing with the resurrection. When you know that the resurrection happened, all the other things take a second step of importance because the resurrection validates the Christian message. So point number one, the resurrection is a big deal because Christianity either stands or falls with it. Point number two, the resurrection is a big deal because it is God's guarantee of the life that is to come. It's the hope that God gives to us. I love the example of Larry King. You guys know who Larry King is? It's the talk show host, really old. Uh, the New York Times recently published an article about him, how he has an obsession with death. And... 
Right now, he begins his day with reading obituaries, and he thinks about who's going to be the guy giving the eulogy at his funeral, and he thinks it might be Bill Clinton, and he smiles, but then he, his face goes blank because he realizes he won't be there to hear it. Uh, he's had a heart attack, he's had bypass surgery, prostate cancer, diabetes, and seven divorces. When CNN released him, they dropped him from their network when he was 77 years old. He became aware that, you know what, my day that I'm going to die is going to come. And when he heard about Osama bin Laden's death, he, he just said he, he jumped on his feet and he said, I, I need to be on the air, I need a red light to go on. He realized he had nowhere to go, he was trapped. This reality of death was coming close. It's funny because to move against aging and death, he takes hormone pills for human growth, four of them a day, and he plans to have his body frozen so that someday he could potentially live again and be unfrozen. He himself admits that this is nuts, but this is what he says. He says, but at least it gives me a shred of hope. Other people have no hope. I want to ask you this question. What kind of hope is that? It is absurd that we're going to put you in a freezer and then one day we're going to unfreeze you. And th this man continues to live day by day thinking and hoping that one day he will be unfrozen and brought back to life. We all need hope. And I'm going to argue that Christianity offers us the greatest hope through the resurrection. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 20 through 22 say, But in fact... Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as by a man came death, by a man has, also, has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. You see, in Adam we all die because we're related. We are part of Adam's family. We come from him. He sinned. He died, we sin, we will die because we are part of his family. But if you are also a part of Christ's family, you will never die. Because he says, whoever believes in me becomes a part of my family, becomes my brother and my sister. And if you are part of Christ's family, you will never see the second death. You might die like Christ did, but you will be raised from the dead to have eternal life with God. And so we can have hope through the resurrection, that those who die knowing Christ have not perished. Point number two, the resurrection's a big deal because it gives us, because it's God's guarantee of the life that is to come, not some human hormone pills and freezers. Point number three, the resurrection is a big deal because Without the resurrection, anything that you do that is right and good is completely meaningless. And without the resurrection, it's completely okay to do wrong. It's okay to do whatever you feel like. Paul says in verse 32, he says, What do I gain if, humanly speaking, I fought with beasts at Ephesus? You're like, I didn't know Paul had a gladiator side to him. He didn't. Uh, he is, it's an analogy. When he came to the city of Ephesus, he started preaching the gospel and people started believing in Christ and they started abandoning their idols. And the man, the businessman that owned the business of creating idols was infuriated because his business was hurt and so he opposed the gospel message. Obviously, that didn't feel good. Paul was doing what is right and he, it, it hurt him and it cost him a lot. And he's saying, if there's no resurrection, then what do I gain from that? And look, let's look at Paul's other sufferings. And keep in mind as I read his other sufferings from 2 Corinthians, this is one person. This is not a church. This is not a group of people. This is one person. He says, five times I have received at the hand of the Jews 39 lashes. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I was adrift at sea on frequent journeys in danger from rivers, danger from robbers, danger from my own people, danger from Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers, in toil and hardship, though many, through many a sleepless night, in hunger and thirst, 
often without food, in cold and exposure, and apart from these things, there is the daily pressure on me of my anxiety for all the churches. Paul is enduring all of that because he knew that he was doing the right thing. He knew that it was good. And what he's saying is, look, if there's no resurrection, what's the point? What's the point of doing anything good? What do I gain? And I want to ask you, what is the point? If there is no resurrection, if when you just close your eyes and that's the end and your TV screen goes black, what's the point of doing anything good when it costs so much, when the price is so high? And on the flip side, Paul says, if there is no resurrection, if the dead are not raised, then let us eat and drink for tomorrow we die. All we have is today. Let us live up for this moment because tomorrow is no promise. If what we do doesn't matter, then who cares about right and wrong? Let us act on whatever brings us immediate satisfaction. And that's the right thinking if there is no resurrection. But if the resurrection is true, then that flips the whole reality on its head. You see, the resurrection gives meaning and purpose to all the good that we do in this life. If you're going to remember any phrase, remember this one. The resurrection gives meaning and purpose to all the good that we do in this life. The good that you do matters. And on the flip side, the resurrection reminds us that all wrongdoing, that we will have to account for all wrongdoing. Or in the words of Jesus himself in John chapter 5, verse 25, he says, Truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming and is now here when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God. That's all of us. And those who hear will live. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son also to have life in himself. And he has given him authority to execute judgment because he is the Son of Man. Do not marvel at this. For an hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and come out. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life. Those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. No one not a single human being that has ever existed will escape from God because of the resurrection. Hitler killed himself thinking that he can escape when he knew he was, he was defeated. He thought that was a way out. There is no way out because of the resurrection. All evil, all wrongdoing will be judged and punished justly. And if you doubt that, I urge you to reconsider the reality of the resurrection. So on one hand, the resurrection is an encouragement for those who do good, even though the price is very high. And on the other hand, the resurrection is a warning to everyone who does wrong, even though there may seem to be little or no consequences in this present moment. Point number four. Before I go into that, let's read, let's open up 1 Corinthians 15, verse 35. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 35. Paul continues. But someone will ask, how are the dead raised? With what kind of body do they come? You foolish person. What you sow does not come to life unless it dies. And what you sow is not the body that is to be, but a bare kernel, perhaps of wheat or of some other grain, but God gives it a body as he has chosen, and to each kind of seed its own body. For not all flesh is the same, but there is one kind for humans, another for animals, another for birds, and another for fish. There are heavenly bodies and earthly bodies, but the glory of the heavenly is of one kind, and the glory of the earthly is of another. There is, there is one glory of the sun, and another glory of the moon, and another glory of the stars. For star differs from star in glory, so it is with the resurrection of the dead. What is sown is perishable, what is raised is imperishable. What is sown in dishonor, it is raised in glory. What is sown in weakness is raised in power. It is sown a natural body, it is raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. 
Thus it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam, that's Christ, became a life-giving spirit. But it is not the spiritual that is first, but the natural, and then the spiritual. The first man was from the earth, a man of dust. The second man is from heaven. As was the man of dust, so also are those who are of the dust. And as is the man of heaven, so also are those who are of heaven. Just as we have borne the image of the man of dust, so shall, also, so shall we bear the image of the man of heaven. The fourth reason why the resurrection is a big deal because the resurrection promises us that the best is yet to come. Notice the language that Paul is using. He's saying what is sown perishable is raised imperishable. What is sown in dishonor is raised in glory. Whatever is sown in weakness is raised in power. Natural, spiritual. And we see this happening with the life of Christ as well. Think about it. He died a shameful death. Cicero, the Roman politician, speaking on the crucifixion. You know what he called? You know what he said about the crucifixion? He said, it is a most cruel and disgusting punishment. And he suggested that the very mention of the cross should be far removed, not only from the Roman citizen's body, but from his mind, his eyes, and his ears. Can you believe that? That the Romans back in that time said, this punishment is so disgusting, it is so shameful, that not only should a Roman citizen not be crucified, but he shouldn't even see people being crucified. He shouldn't think about it. He shouldn't hear about it. And yet our Lord died by the form of crucifixion. And you know, when we look at paintings of Jesus, we all, always see Jesus hanging on the cross, and he's got a little cloth on him, right? Right? Do you know that in, in reality, when people were crucified, they were crucified naked in order to be publicly humiliated. Our God, Jesus, on this earth, died naked on a cross. He died a shameful death. He died in dishonor, in weakness. And yet we read in Philippians that on the last day, every knee shall bow. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. The resurrection reminds us that the best is yet to come. Not only for us, but it was the same thing for Jesus. And I love Paul's comparisons that he makes because it also reminds me of Christ's Beatitudes in Matthew 5. He says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. He says, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. Do you know why Christ's beatitudes are true? Because between those two comparisons that he makes sits the resurrection. If there was no resurrection, then Christ's beatitudes would not be applicable to us. And that being said, it is wrong to try to have your best life here on earth. This is not all that we have, brothers and sisters. This life is not all that we have, and we shouldn't cling to it like others who don't know Christ cling to it. This is not our best life. And I love the analogy that Paul brings up of the seed. You see, you don't, you don't just store a seed forever without planting it. The whole point of a seed is, like, one, you can either eat it, or two, if you want to create a plant, you have to plant it. There's no other way for a seed to create a plant and bear more fruit. They're useless. And I love David Crowder's song, I Am a Seed. He says, oh, I've been pushed down into the ground. Oh, how I've been trampled down. So many feet on top of me, I can't help but sink, sink, sink. Oh, how I've been pushed down into the ground. Oh, how I've been trampled down. Lord, I put my trust in thee. You won't turn your back on me. This is the life of a Christian. We are all seeds, and unless, 
Unless we are buried, unless we give up our lives, unless we die for the glory of Christ, we will never have that eternal life. And Or in the words of Jesus himself, he says, John chapter 12, verse 24, he says, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat, that's us, falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Whoever loves his life loses it. And whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, he must follow me. And where I am, there will my servant be also. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. You know, the way, the way that we follow Christ is by giving up our lives, is by not trying to live our best lives here on this earth. That is the only way because where did Jesus go? Jesus went onto Calvary. He gave up his life. He took the path of self-sacrifice, of living for the glory of Christ. We cannot be Christians without giving up our lives for Christ. This is a reality. This is not something for super spiritual Christians. This is not something for pastors, but this is for every single person who claims that they are a follower of Christ. <laughs> Living for this life only is like focusing your entire life on making sure you have the best seed possible. Just imagine we all have a seed when we're born and you carry it around and, and you, you pay so much attention to it and you walk around comparing it to other people's seeds. Well, my seed's got little white dots with a little blue stripe on the bottom. My seed's way better than yours and everyone's got this little special pouch and they put the seed in and everyone just loves their little seed. If we live for this life only, that's all we're doing is just taking care of this little seed that we're going to lose anyway. Instead of planting it and having it become so much greater than what it is at that moment. Let us give up our seed lives here on earth. Let us lay it down. Let us be trampled into the ground. Let people step on us, but so that we can be in the dirt and then give life. Let us hate our life in this world like Jesus tells us so that we can become something so much greater in eternity. And so we can reap the full spiritual life. For my last point, I want to ask you guys a question. When we study scriptures... Who do we see as our greatest enemy? Is it evil people like ISIS or maybe an evil coworker that you have that you can't stand? Is it our flesh that's always tempting us to sin just over and over and over again? Surely it must be the devil, right? Because he started all of this. But how about death? Have you thought about that one? Revelations chapter 20, verse 9. This is a vision that John's seen, and he, he sees a vision of how Satan deceived people, and they are marching against the people of God in Jerusalem. And as they're marching, this is where it picks up, verse 9 says, And they marched over the broad plain of the earth, and surrounded the camp of the saints in the beloved city, but fire came down from heaven and consumed them. And the devil who had deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur where the beast and the false prophet were, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Then John goes on to say, Then I saw a great white throne, and him who was seated on it. From his presence earth and sky fled away, and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. Then another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged by what was written in the books according to what they had done. And the sea gave up the dead who were in it. Death and Hades gave up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one of them, according to what they had done. And then pay attention, it says, Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. Death itself, and this is a really mysterious passage, but what it tells us is that death itself will be destroyed. Death is an enemy and it will be thrown into the lake of fire exactly where Satan is. And 1 Corinthians 15, 26 says that the last enemy to be destroyed is death. It's not Satan. It's not the devil. It's not our flesh. 
And so point number five, the resurrection is a big deal because it is a promise that our greatest enemy will be defeated. Let's read verses 54 through 56. 1 Corinthians 15, 54 says, when the perishable puts on the imperishable. He's talking about when the second coming of Christ, when we are raised from the dead, he says, when the perishable puts on the imperishable and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Christ. You see, Christ's resurrection, when he was raised from the dead three days later, had begun the defeat of death. It was the beginning of, of death being defeated. We know that death is still, still rules, and we know that every single one of us are subject to it. We no longer have to fear it because we know it will be defeated and that we will overcome death. So Christ's resurrection began the defeat of death, but when he returns and when we are raised from the dead, he will finish it. The enemy will be completely destroyed, our last enemy. And, and again, the reason why I think death is our greatest enemy is because, one, death is universal. Every single person has to face it. Everyone has to walk down that alley, that valley of death, right? Right? And very few people uh, have experiences, direct experiences with the dark side of the spiritual world, like dev the devil or demons, right? But every single person has to face death. And you might say, well, how about the flesh? It's always just going against us. It's always tempting us to sin, right? And I agree. But the reason why I think death is still the greater enemy is because, one, the passages that we looked at, and two, is based on the fact that the flesh used to be good. It used to be good. And, but it was corrupted. So it's something good that was corrupted, whereas death was never good. There was never anything good about death. Now, what I want all of us to do right now is create an inventory list. Just create a list right now in your mind. Uh, just start making a list and of everything that you possibly have in this world. So let's start with your relationships, all the close people, all the people that you love dearly. Put them on that list. All your material possessions, all the things that you prize highly, that you really like, all your honor, all your status, all the things that you are proud of, not even in a bad way, but in a good way. List all your smarts, all your knowledge, your degrees, all your wisdom, all your accomplishments, your ambitions. Put your personalities on that list, your opinions, your thoughts, the things you like, the things you don't like, your preferences, your bodies, your health. Put all that on that list. Now, do you realize that the day that you die, all of that, every single thing on that list, will be taken away from you? We will be robbed and stripped of all of that because that's what death is. Death robs us of life, and life contains all of those things in there. So that means all the people that you love, that you know, you will be severed from them. There will be no communication. You can't go to them and talk to them or say any other words. All your material possessions will be taken away. This shirt that's on my back will be taken away from me. My watch, my ring, everything that I possibly have will be taken away. All your honor, all your status, all your accomplishments, your ambitions, all your brains, everything that you're smart about, all your knowledge about particular subjects, your personalities will be taken away. Your preferences, your thoughts, your likes, your dislikes, your opinions, all of that will be stripped away when death comes. Your health, your body, no matter how well you take care of it, it will be taken away from all of us. Death is our greatest enemy. And Christ's resurrection is God's way of defeating that enemy. Christ's resurrection gives us that hope that one day God will destroy this enemy that robs all of us of these precious things that God has given to us. When I think about 
the topic of death, when I think about the resurrection of Christ, and when I think about the grand resurrection, an image comes into my mind. I imagine uh, like a superhero movie or something, right? And there's this dragon, and that's death, and it's just going around and just slaying everybody, and it's just horror, and there is nothing good about it. And then there's a hero, Jesus, right? And, and the moment and you think that dragon's about to kill our hero, and we have no hope, and then all of a sudden, it's like right in the movies, you know, you see him pull out his sword, that weapon that he was hiding, and you, he pulls it out, and it glimmers in the sun, and that's the moment you realize this dragon is dead meat. He will take him out with that sword right now. You see, Christ's resurrection is like Christ pulling out that sword. It's that moment where you go from having no hope to complete hope. You know that sword will soon be thrust into the heart of that dragon, and your enemy will be destroyed. That's what Christ's resurrection is. And when Christ, when the hero actually thrusts the sword into the heart of the dragon, killing it, that is the grand resurrection. That is when Christ will return and we will be raised imperishable. Jesus is our hero. And the resurrection reminds us that our greatest enemy will be defeated. The one that robs us of everything we have will be forever put away. So to recap, the resurrection is a big deal for Paul. And there's a few reasons. One is that Christianity stands or falls with it. Two, the resurrection is God's guarantee of the life that is to come. Three, because without the resurrection, all that we do that, that is good is completely meaningless. And if we do wrong, it's totally okay, as long as it brings us immediate satisfaction. Four, the resurrection promises that the best is yet to come. And five, the resurrection is the promise of the defeat of our greatest enemy. So right now you might ask, what now? What now? I love how Paul finishes this segment, the chapter actually, in verse 58, as he talks about the defeat of death and the resurrection. He finishes this long, it's not a speech, but this segment in his letter, and he says, Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. Be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. He says, because of the resurrection, in light of everything that I just talked about and just told you that we are perishable, but we will be raised imperishable, that our enemy will be defeated, that good has meaning and wrong will be judged. In light of all of this spiritual reality, he says, do these things. And he says, one, be steadfast. It means be consistent. Don't be shaky or flaky. Just be completely steadfast. Be three, two, two, be immovable. Don't let anything hit you off course of doing and following the right path. And three, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Brothers and sisters, ministry, that is the work of the Lord, it's not a concept made up by people in the church. It's not an idea that pastors made up to involve Christians into church activities. Ministry is a command from God given to us based on these spiritual realities. And when Paul talks to the Corinthians, he's addressing all Christians He's not talking to pastors or the very spiritual people or Christians with free time. He's talking to every single person that claims to be a Christian. And I'm going to be very straightforward right now. If you claim to be a Christian and you are not giving yourself away, if you are not serving and denying yourself and following Christ, then one of the two things is true. One is either you are not a real Christian and you need to relook your Christianity, or two, you are a Christian, but you have very serious issues that you need to address immediately. Paul addresses all of us, always abounding in the work of the Lord. And I think this always abounding in the work of the Lord, I think it includes serving our friends and family. I think it includes that, but I don't think it stops there. You know, some people... Some of us like to say, well, my, my family is my ministry. 
That's, that's my ministry, right? My family, and I'm just going to serve my family. Do you want to hear what Jesus says about our family ministry? Luke chapter 6, verse 32 says, If you love those who love you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. And if you lend to those from whom you expect to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners to get back the same amount. But love your enemies and do good and lend, expecting nothing in return, and your reward will be great, and you will be sons of the Most High, for he is kind to the ungrateful and the evil. Be merciful even as your Father is merciful. Paul tells us, based on the resurrection, make sure that we are steadfast and movable, and always abounding in the work of the Lord. Why? Because he says, knowing that in the Lord, your labor is not in vain. Everything that you do for Christ, every single thing, however small, however big, doesn't matter if you serve 50 years, somebody who is completely ungrateful, doesn't thank you, and returns you evil for that. If you're doing it for the Lord, it is not in vain. Because of the resurrection. There will come a day when God will call us out of our tombs and we will all stand before him. And if you are his, all the good that you do will not be in vain. And believe me, God does not, God is not going to disappoint us with his promises. Amen? Let's pray.
His wounds have made my 